Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time and welcome you to the Latter Gay Stories Podcast. It's here that we help build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community through the sharing and telling of stories. And we have another fantastic episode for you today. We want to welcome you if you're watching on a video version of the podcast episode through Facebook or YouTube to uh, participate and enjoy and use that live chat feature. If you are watching on a video version, there is a community of people who are watching along with you. And if you have comments about this episode or a question directly for our guest, that's a great place to do it. Even if you're catching this episode outside of the original premiere, when we premiere this uh, episode, we invite you to still participate in the comment section because we have an active and vibrant community. And if you are listening on an audio version of the podcast through one of our audio podcast players, we welcome you and invite you to subscribe to this channel. And for those who are uh, now listening on the Amazon Prime family of podcasts, we welcome you as well. Thanks to the many listeners, Amazon has invited the Latter Gay Stories podcast to be part of the Amazon Prime podcast family. So uh, you can catch your podcast episodes there as well. In addition to, to uh, Apple and uh, Google and iHeartMedia and Spotify and all the others. You can find this and uh, other podcasts everywhere you find your favorite audio podcasts. And if you want to catch an older episode, you can also log on to our website at LatterGayStories.org and you can connect with uh, many uh, uh, episodes specific to a uh, subject you're looking for or a specific person. You can do a search there and it'll pull it right up at uh, LatterGayStories.org. So kind of a cool feature. With that aside, I want to welcome uh, to the Latter Gay Stories podcast our guest of the day, someone who I am uh, super excited to interview and super excited to have here in the studio, Colby Majors. Welcome, Colby. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm super excited about uh, having this interview and picking your brain a little bit and letting the world uh, get to know you a little bit better. Uh, if anything, um, I think this is a great interview because your story, you've and we'll talk about this a little later in your podcast episode, but you, um, I think the first time I came across um, Colby's story was uh, with an interview that you did with um, Richard Osler a couple of years ago, maybe just less than two years ago. Yeah. And uh, it was fascinating to see uh, Colby at that stage and Colby today. Right. And uh, you've recorded a few interviews since, which is I've just been super excited and fascinated by this um, genesis and exodus uh, of different um, traditions, of different experiences. And to me, it's been pretty exciting to, be, to watch that, to listen, to hear the changes, but also uh, to be a friend that sees your real life um, experiences and changes that are unfolding um, before all of our eyes. And we won't give that complete teaser away, <laughs> but we'll talk about it a little later in the podcast. Okay, so. that works. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited. I think this is, this is going to be a great interview, and I'm excited to be able to have the chat. But first, for those who don't know who you are, uh, give the audience uh, a little bit of a, a brief introduction to who Colby is. Okay. Those are always difficult because I don't know what to say. Um, no, um, I'm from a small town here in Utah called Huntington. It's a small farming community, if you will, and so anything that is different there it was difficult to kind of navigate growing up um right now i i live in, in roy so just northern part of utah um i have a seven-year-old daughter named aria and she's a spunky light of my life um i work in a residential treatment center uh, with teenagers so we we work with a lot of mental health and struggles that way and substance abuse. And so I started off as a mentor there, but I moved over to reception, but I'm still active in kind of an admissions process with, with teenagers. And so when I see teens coming in who are struggling with different aspects of, of their life, I can relate to that uh, as far as like mental health struggles go. Um, but I've grown to uh, accept and kind of value different avenues and different, different, uh, backgrounds of people and an open person. And so it, it's kind of helped me in my 
adult years of life. I think this will be an interesting interview for those who are tuning in. Um, they often wonder, I, I don't typically give a, a big introduction as to what this uh, interview is going to be about, just to encourage people to listen. But I think a fascinating part of your story, typically when I do these interviews, I'll I'll begin with the, at what point do you realize you're different? At what point did you realize that something about you wasn't um, as normal, and I air quote that, as right. some of your friends or family members experienced? But I think your interview is going to be fascinating too, because uh, for those who are uh, met at this intersection of sexuality and religion, particularly Mormonism, um, you're a convert to the church, uh, who also realized that he was gay before he joined the church. Yeah. So that'll be a fascinating part of this uh, this conversation that we're going to have today. I also think a, a interesting part of your story, unlike um, many recently that we've interviewed, is that you uh, entered into a mixed orientation marriage. Uh, you married a woman, and as you talked about, uh, had your daughter. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that as well, because uh, this is a topic that, um, fortunately, we don't run into as often, but still, gay men are marrying straight women, um, particularly within Mormonism, in an attempt to fix themselves or rid themselves yeah. of their sexuality. So um, let's talk about... Um, Let's start with the point where you're different, where you start recognizing that some parts of you um, aren't as, um, they don't line up as symbiotically as those of your friends. And let's kind of walk through that. Uh, those feelings, those uh, experiences that helped you realize, I'm a little different. Yeah, of course. That was about 12. I was about 12. At the time I lived with my dad, I met him when I was a bit younger and uh, moved in, lived with him for a couple of years during middle school. And at the time, hormones are all over the place. And so I did go on dates with girls or dated, but relationships became more of like a brother, sister kind of. That's what I got most of the time. I was more like a brother to those who I dated. And I couldn't figure out what was going on or why. Of course, I was a kid, and so I didn't really understand that concept. But um, it was a difficult growing up because my dad wasn't a very supportive man. I lived with him just because he wanted to be in my life, that father figure. But it was a very distant relationship. And so I would spend a lot of my time hanging out with friends just to kind of escape that. And I would find support through them. But a lot of my friends were were female, were girls. And so I grouped up a lot with, with different, different types of groups of girls. And I felt comfortable there. I felt a part of uh, a community, even though I was a teenager, a young teenager at that time, I kind of understood at 12 or 13 that I'm comfortable around girls. And you see a lot of guys with their guy groups of friends. And I never had that. Um, I had Yes, I had friends who were guys, but not as close as other relationships. And so there's a lot of comfort. I felt there a lot of acceptance and peace, and I felt myself. But whenever I was at home, I never felt that from, from my dad. And like I said, our relationship was kind of chaotic. Um, he wasn't as present, even though I lived with him. He wasn't a present person. So I would find ways to escape that through through friends, through groups of friends. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Huntington. Okay. Um, for those who aren't familiar uh, with uh, Huntington, Utah, we're talking um, in a almost very real sense, a gay ghost town. Just very few, not only, I mean, just uh, lacking diversity, but Huntington, Utah is coal and power generation. Yeah. <laughs> that is uh, the length and breadth of of Huntington, Utah, there just isn't much there. A very sparsely populated, um, kind of an Eastern Utah, desertish um, community. And the main income um, or economic producers in the area are coal mining and a power plant that mm -hmm. generates electricity. So not a lot of culture, not a lot of um, flair, right. and probably not a lot of uh, rainbow flags. Nope in Main Street. No, not at all. No, I, so growing up, we, my family and I, we moved back and forth 
from Huntington to like the Salt Lake area quite often um, throughout my school age years. But Huntington is home. That's that's where um, I escaped to 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 kind of escape the world, if you will. But growing up, well, let's see. It was my senior year of high school when I went moved back permanently um, from out of state. We lived out of state for a bit, and we moved back to Huntington, and I graduated there, and a lot of my childhood memories kind of flooded in when we moved back and I was excited to be with, with friends that I grew up with. Um, and at the time I knew at least three or four guys around my age that were gay, but again, they were quiet or closeted. They kept that to themselves. Um, there were a few that were open and I often thought that even though they were having a difficult time with that, especially in a small community, I wanted that too, but I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know what to do. And so I really just kind of stuck it out and it's highly populated with members of the church. Um, it's highly concentrated. And so the friends that I hung out with were all active in the church and I found peace in that, even though it was kind of complex, kind of complicated. The two differences of thinking or ways of wanting to live, I didn't feel could can mesh or collide. Um, and so that caused a lot of complex issues for me as a 17 year old. Um, and that's about the time that I joined the church was at 17. And I was a convert. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about these uh, paradox, these di these dichotomies that are forming in your life. Uh, for so many of us, um, especially growing up in these um, small communities, I also grew up in a really small two or three hundred person town, um, kind of in tucked away Utah. Really difficult for us to uh, put words and language to the feelings that exist within us. And we know we know we're different. We know something about us is different, but lacking all of the terminology and um, the freedom and the abilities to be out, I didn't see or or ever have that ab ability to to interact with on a on a very social and open level with other queer people. Um, so I think this is a fascinating part of the interview. Um, you haven't joined the church, but you have friends. Um, that are part of the church. Mm -hmm. So it, this gives you a little bit of an idea as to what the church knows and understands about this topic. But um, let's talk about why you wanted to join the church. Why at 17 was there a draw for you to seek out the church? I, I will go back a little bit because when I lived with my dad, I was interested then at 13, 14 years old. And he was, he had joined the church when he was a teenager, but it, it was difficult because he had no longer believed in it and things that happened in his life where he became bitter towards the church. And so he allowed me to visit with missionaries, but there was no fruition from that. And so when I had that opportunity to join, um, I took it because my mom was reactivated. My stepdad at the time joined the church and that concept of forever families was something that struck out to me. And so I thought, well, I want to be with my family forever. I want this in my life. So I took it upon myself to seek that out and to, and to meet with the missionaries. Um, I mean, as a teenager, I was kind of a punk too. And so there were times where I didn't want to meet with them. I didn't want them to come over and talk to me because I wasn't interested at the time. But it was about a month before I graduated from high school when I made that, when I was baptized. Um, I wanted that because I felt it was necessary to do and the kind of the constant teaching of families are forever, families are forever, really was embedded. And that's what I wanted was, was something. And I did it because I felt it was a way to cover up what I was hiding, my sexuality, 
um, and a way to, I mean, it's a common phrase people use, but to pray the gay away. I knew that I was different. I felt that inside me, and I wanted a way to dispel that. I'm curious how, um, what about Mormonism, or what about the missionaries, or what about the message uh, convinced you that it was possible to pray that away, that it was possible for the church to disentangle this sexuality mess that had been really raging in your life now for four years, mm -hmm. five years. It was that constant teaching that Christ can remove anything away from you. Christ can take away if you sacrifice something or if you gave up something that he would be there to, to take your sins away. And so it was that it was the teaching or the concept of if you take your challenges to him, that he would be the one to, to remove that. He would be the one to take away. And of course, in the Book of Mormon or in the Bible, all the, all the stories that you read of these people who struggle with sicknesses or whatever the case is, that once they sacrificed or took that to Christ, he would take that away from them. And so I thought, this is great. This is something that I don't want to deal with anymore or any longer. And so I was willing to do whatever it would, would take to, to give that up or to give that to him so he can remove that from me. Did you um, have any discussion with your missionaries, with the district leader who interviewed you, um, or anyone at all about your sexuality? Was that part of your conversion story, putting no. that on the altar, letting them know why you were joining? Not at all. No, I, um, you know, sh struggled, use those air quotes again, uh, with, you know, masturbation or pornography or experiencing different things, but I just put that away and kept it in this tight little box in my soul for so long that I didn't address that with anybody. And um, I went through interviews. I, I hid it well enough to not even imply anything. Like I talked about, you know, struggles with family issues or whatever the case was with them and sought out uh, guidance or direction or instruction from, from, mission, from the missionaries. But I didn't even give any clue to my sexuality. Well, like all good Latter-day Saints, um, you're baptized into the church, they give you the priesthood, and now it's uh, off to serve a mission. Yeah. And you, at the ripe old age of 18, one year into your uh, journey as a Latter-day Saint, were called to serve in for a two-year mission, in the mission of? I went to Barcelona, Venezuela mission. And yeah, it was, I left, it was about a year and four months after I joined the church when I went into the MTC. And at that time, you're in the MTC, especially going internationally, you're there for two months learning a language. And you're with a other group of missionaries who come with their own issues and you're with companions that you don't know well enough at all. And you're here in this, place that's not far away from your family or from my family, I should say, um, for those two months. And I remember we had two elders that struggled being there and they both had left early because they were, they weren't ready to serve and they had other th issues or other things that they had to take care of. And as soon as the second one left internally, I was a mess. I struggled um, any type of communication with my companion. I struggled with the scriptures. Like I was in them, but I was extremely distracted. And after the second missionary had gone home, I went to my mission president in the MTC. Well, first I was, excuse me, I went to another missionary and we became really close and I opened up to him about some things that I had done prior and not, entirely talking about my sexuality 
but some struggles that I had previously that I dealt with or worked through or whatever before going on my mission. And he convinced me to go to our mission president. And I remember sitting across from him with this other elder next to me, just sobbing. And I, and I told him, I told him that I struggled with the pornography or the masturbation and all sorts of different things that I addressed with him. But I did not one once talked about being gay and being attracted to men. I just did the, the typical teenager struggles prior to going. And he had me study the Book of Mormon and he had me pray and he had me journal. And, but I remember he gave me a blessing of forgiveness and had me call my family after that meeting, kind of go through what happened and what I did with my mom over the phone but I was still able to go out and serve. And that was an intense situation to be in because I was afraid I was going to be sent home. And again, going back to small town Utah, um, I was afraid of what people would say coming home early because I had a cousin who did that, who came home early and the town talked. Yeah, culturally, for those who don't understand how Mormon missions work, um, when you leave, you're expected to leave if you're a male missionary for 24 months. If you're a female missionary, it's 18 months. And um, there is, fortunately, uh, this is changing a little bit, but there's this cultural aspect that if you come home early from your mission, um, it's because you did something wrong. uh, And there is this kind of flog of, public shame that kind of cloaks over this missionary and it's a real thing and it's it's not healthy for missionaries whether they come home under a cloak of darkness uh, things that they did on their mission that weren't um, in line with mission rules uh, mental health uh, just a variety of reasons why they come home it doesn't matter the membership um, has this cultural experience where they they almost as if, I don't know, this is hard to explain to it. It's almost as if, like a lot of these Latter-day Saints just say like they weren't, they're just not good enough. Um, so some church leaders will withhold callings, withhold other opportunities from these missionaries, kind of like public shaming, and it isn't good. So I, I, I just want the audience to kind of no, recognize right. why that was important to you. Absolutely. Uh, I remember being in MTC after that conversation with my mission president and that darkness came over me in the form of anxiety and depression. I remember I got extremely sick on uh, during the MTC um, and I really wanted to go home. I really wanted to be with family and be in that comfort of what I was familiar with, despite the fear of what could happen if I did go home earlier. But I went through the full two months at the MTC and I just made it work. I remember watching the video from Elder Halden, Don't You Dare Go Home, his talk that he gave. And I was struggling and it was so dark and despaired um, but I panicked and I said, if, if I, and I thought to myself, if I went home, this is what's going to happen. And I, I went, I went into the field. I went for two months in North Carolina, right in the Bible belt. Um, and then to Venezuela, not long after the two months. Did they, they say you did North Carolina as a visa waiter, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. Uh, and just for our audience, a visa waiter, just you haven't got your visa yet to go into Venezuela. Therefore they send you to a, another mission mm-hmm. until that visa comes through. Right. And I had two companions there. So we were in a trio and they were dedicated, hard workers. And I remember a few times with the drastic anxiety attacks that I would get, we would have to go back home. We would have to go because I couldn't, function while out and there were some times that I didn't even say anything to my companions we just would ride our bikes and visit people and I would just stick it out and 
it just added another layer of that depression that I was experiencing. How much, um, how much support did you feel like you got from the church, these church leaders? Um, or maybe even a further question to that is where could the church have done better to support um, someone like you who was serving? I think, you know, I had, a, I actually had a pretty good, my, my com- companion in the trio, the one companion in the trio, he was very understanding. Um, not that I didn't lack any kind of support. My mission president was pretty solid. He was a pretty supportive man. Um, but the mission home was like an hour, two hours away. And so I didn't have any communication with him very well. Um, but the other elder, we became really close and he often, like I would confide in him and he would open up a bit and just give me the comfort that I needed. It never really lacked. It was just more of what I was experiencing. Um, but it was still a complicated thing. I remember I was able to call home while in, in North Carolina just to have that reassurance from my family that what I was doing was what I was meant to do. Um, all my family are an act, they're still active from the church, but I remember having a conversation with my mom's sister, my aunt, and she was very supportive. And it was that, that motherly female um, support that I had that helped me just keep pushing forward, just keep pushing ahead, that something was going to give. If I continued to serve and to sacrifice my time, that this was going to go away, that anxiety, depression was going to go away. And here I am at 37, and I'm still working through that. I I have this feeling that a lot of that anxiety and depression that you experienced on your mission, um, I don't don't want to say in whole, but a large part of that was this hiding of a great secret. Oh, absolutely. It was very much that. And like I mentioned earlier, I had tucked it away in a nice little box and just held on to that. So no one can find it. No one can see it. No one can... I. Um, and I was careful how I would work around it when we would talk with people about um, different sins or different, you know, when we, when we would teach and they would ask me examples and I would just work around it because I didn't want anyone to know. It was pretty heavy. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point too that we don't talk a lot about on the podcast, but as missionaries, we teach the law of chastity or did teach the law of chastity, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's, it's in those lessons that we teach that often we, have, we feel like we teach best through example. Like if I can share a story via the examples in my life, I think I can get this message across. Mm-hmm. So it does put us in an odd predicament when we have to kind of skirt around these examples um, and have this introspection, like this, uh, th- it's almost as if it's like, I want you to live this law and I want you to be perfect and beautiful and whole, uh, but I don't feel like I am. Right. And that can often feel super hollow uh, to a missionary, um, it just from an internal perspective. Well, internal, but also this huge contradiction. Like here I am serving and teaching and this law of chastity or the law of consecration or the law of sacrifice or whatever the case may be. And I'm doing all of these things. And here I am often uh, during that time, I would think I'm a huge hypocrite. Like I'm, I'm here teaching these people the gospel and I'm living it as best I can. And yet when we talk about certain topics, I'm lying to these people essentially. And that again, it's just another layer on top of, this whole situation of of withholding information or withholding a lie or a secret. And it, like I said, it's just, just had caused so much angst. Yeah, and there eventually becomes a point where it becomes too much. And 
the, the weight of that bears uh, too much of a burden. Our ability to um, have sound mental health is impacted, and you experienced that. Mm-hmm. I did. Once I finally got to Venezuela, I only served in a couple of areas during that time. And towards the end of my first area, I I got extremely ill. Um, oftentimes the anxiety attacks would be so severe that I would black out while walking in the streets of Venezuela. Or we would have to come home early or at one time... We were in our apartment for a good three or four days because I just couldn't function mentally, emotionally, even physically. Like I was so physically sick that there wasn't much we can do. And then there was the, I felt guilty because my companion was a worker. He, he was, he was our district leader and he just was set out to teach and get those numbers and I felt awful for not being able to go out, but there was nothing that I could do about it. And that was the same case in my second area. I think I was in my second area for about four months. And again, towards the end, that all that weight had just finally just broke me down. Then I got sick again, and I, we were out for about a week. And that level of guilt just kept going and going, and I... I that was it for me. That was the breaking point at that time where I finally met with my mission president. We got myself a, a therapist to talk to and did all of these tests to see blood work and urine samples and all these sorts of things to see if anything else was happening and really come to find out was just the anxiety that I was experiencing. So your mission president's suggestion at this point was what? Well, he wanted me to talk with our mission doctor uh, back here in the States and explain to him what I was experiencing, what I was going through, the symptoms, um, how it affected the work, how it affected me and and teaching. And so he spoke with uh, my mission president, and they decided that it was time for me to go home. Um, It was about 10 months total from the MTC to uh, June 2005 that I was out for that length of time. Let's, I know this is sensitive territory, um, but what was it like coming home and facing uh, the ward, your family, those things that we just talked about a few minutes ago about uh, the cultural aspects of an early return missionary? Um, How do you navigate that in a healthy way um, when also you know that you're, air quote, still suffering? Right from same-sex attraction, uh, which is really, a lot of this is the core to this anxiety and depression that you were experiencing. Around the time I was baptized, and uh, about five months before I was my stepdad was baptized, we had really created a, a pretty solid support group with people in our ward and in our, within our stake. And so when I came home, I was I was welcomed. The fear of being talked about, being the talk of the town, coming home early, um, that was subsided mostly because we had created a solid support system prior to me leaving. But who who knows what was talked about behind my back or behind doors? Like, I don't know. And I don't want to make any assumptions, but I I can say I was really surprised when I came home to have that acceptance of like, we understand, you know, a lot of people would say missions are for everybody kind of thing. And that really just was like, okay, like I'm home. Like, what do I do now? And to keep myself going, I just, I just went up, went to college just to keep myself busy but I was, I was more than happy to be home. So, and you um, attended CEU, is yeah. that right? Mm. CEU is College of Eastern Utah, which yes. is located in Price. In Price. So not too far from home? No, about a half an hour. And there I went into classes. I signed up for Institute just to keep that spiritual growth happening. Um, I 
had amazing experiences there with an institute. And there's a lot of that then I don't disregard or I had pretty good bishops or stake presidents, which I felt I lucked out on that were supportive and that were really open about different conversations or different types of discussions that we had. So I wasn't too worried about about any of that. Um, but I remember coming home and I was so staunch on attending church, attending institute. Um, I had friends who had differences of opinions and ideas and I would always feel like they were shifting their belief system. And so I would get upset or angry if someone thought differently about something, teachings of the church or whatever. But I, I became really um, aggressive in like my church activity because I still knew what was going on and I felt that inside, but I had to find my way, I find a way to distract myself. And I was home maybe six months when I met my ex-wife and I knew that what the next step was, what I wanted. If I continued this momentum of church activity and that next step after a mission, I knew that my internal struggles were still going to be quieted. Yeah, and I, I think this is an important part for our audience to kind of grasp a hold of. Like this is super familiar territory for so many of us who uh, recognized and understand that there's something about us that is different. We finally put language to that, realize, you know, I'm hella gay and <laughs> I need to figure out a way to undo the gay. And so this is a very familiar road for so many who will say, um, who followed the church's uh, prescription. And still there are leaders today uh, in Mormonism, um, especially our older leaders, who still believe the path to ungaying yourself is a mission, marriage, and children, mm -hmm. uh, typically in that order. Serve a mission, you end up getting married in the temple, have children, there'll be enough responsibility and enough um, roles and opportunities for you to stay so busy, which you just talked about um, and alluded to, that you distract yourself and you get so involved with these new forms of life that, that it just goes away. Right. And for decades, many, many decades, that is how the church overcame same-sex attraction or homosexuality. Right. Well, it goes back to the teachings of sacrifice, like if you sacrifice yourself in a calling and in a family and service in different avenues within the church, if you distract yourself enough, like your own internal struggles will go away. But what people don't understand, or I shouldn't say understand, but what people don't see is that that continuation of adding and adding and adding, eventually someone's going to snap. And... But I knew as soon as I got home what my goal was because I needed to occupy my time by serving a person, an eternal companion, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, it was six months after I got home that I had settled in college and in my dorm and my classes when I, when I met, her name is Leslie, when I met her, we hit it off pretty well, but she was in a place in life that she wasn't ready to get to get married. She had, she had plans that she wanted to do with her education, but we hung out for a bit and started dating, um, about a few months after meeting. And we dated for about a month when I proposed and then we were engaged for four months and we got married a few let's see, about a couple months shy of knowing each other for a full year. And we were married for about 14 years. So, so far, even though you're a convert, you're doing it the Mormon way. Quick and easy, fast uh, engagement. Yeah. And, and off you run. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, 14 years we were married. And during that time, we, sh we struggled. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this at all. We really had a difficult, I wouldn't say difficult marriage. Like we had our successes, but it was constant school education. Like I was doing a lot of schooling um, to figure out what I wanted to do in life. 
three years at a junior college. Uh, uh, the third year was after we had gotten married. Then I did an undergrad at Utah State, and that's f- another four years. And then um, she went back to school. So it was a lot of education. I think something to distract myself. And knowing I, my undergrad didn't take me really anywhere, I wanted that continued education because the church kind of teaches that too, like continued education. It's important to do your education, excuse me, and um, to figure out what you want to do in life so you can support your family. And I just had a dead end. I had no idea what I was going to do with a four-year degree that I wasn't going to really use. And so that idea, that concept of supporting your family, I was lost. So I went back to school and got a master's degree. And yet I didn't use that either. And so I was left with education, loans, and debt, trying to figure out how to provide for my wife and I. And it wasn't going anywhere. So that added a lot of stress onto us. At the same time, still hiding who and what you are, because you don't come out to your wife. Nope. It was, it was before our 14th wedding anniversary that I just held on to this. And I found times to talk to her about previous struggles of, like I mentioned before, the pornography or the masturbation or other kind of awkward things and but she understood to a degree because she comes from a family of six kids and they're all different and not that she was naive to it but there are some parts of it that she didn't understand what it was like to be a convert because she grew up in the church and being a convert and navigating this religion was so difficult for me um, that hiding my secret, keeping that within myself for so long and not coming out to her at all, but I would find little ways of trying to explain what I was struggling with internally. But again, it's that other added layer and my anxiety and my depression just escalated and meeting with therapists and taking medication and finding different avenues to help me with this, it just wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go away. So I would find ways to hide it or to serve in the church and callings just to, again, sacrifice, sacrifice that. And I think uh, we haven't talked a, a lot about your daughter, but I just to reiterate, this, this plan, this path that you went through, you you joined the church in an effort to help you become a more whole, clean, and perfect person. You end up serving a mission uh, with the intent of burying and keeping under a layer of cement this person that mm-hmm. you are. You then um, are fulfilling the roles and responsibilities and duties as expected of you as a righteous husband and father, as the church says. Right. So very literally, you you are investing all of your time, plus 10, into programs, organizations, callings, uh, opportunities within the church. You're a dad. Um, you and your wife are finally, after an extended period of time, able to have uh, a child, right. uh, which becomes the light and life of the party for you guys. Absolutely. And you're doing all the things right. Right. And you're still gay. Right. And it's just piled and piled and piled and piled. It's got to be depressing. It's got to be emotionally difficult and not seeing these beneficial fruits of your labor. Right. I remember, I like to backtrack a little bit. I remember during my time in the MTC when we would have studying and I'm, I'm not, I feel like I'm avoiding something because I don't, I don't want to miss. There was something in particular that really made it difficult for me. You know, the scripture study, um, there's, you know, in the book of Mormon that we use, there's a lot of, at the beginning talking about Nephi and his family. Um, there's a, there's a chapter in second Nephi 
that I call Nephi's psalm. And it's where Nephi, he breaks his bow and he feels terrible for this and not being able to provide for his family. And I can visually look at that chapter there and see almost every verse is highlighted. There's cramped little anxious notes that I would write in the, in the, on the pages because I felt like if this figure, this religious figure can go through a challenge and can come out of it, I can too. And I often think back to that experience because I'm doing everything that I can to, to make it through my mission or my church callings or even my marriage and still nothing's giving, nothing's, nothing's going away. It's not going away. And I don't know what else to do. And I feel like this, this person in this scripture, like giving my all and I can't break it. I can't get rid of it. And no matter how many times I read the scriptures, no matter, no matter how many times I read talks given by church leaders on these kind of issues or the sacrifice or whatever it is, or how many videos I can watch. It's something that I can't break myself of. Like I can't get rid of it. And that's where it gets really frustrating for me. I don't know how many times I've seen therapists or the medication that I've been on for my anxiety and depression. Something is, is not going away. Medication is not going to, get rid of my gayness, my queerness. It's something that's a part of me that I've struggled keeping within. What is the boiling point? Uh, you've done all the things right. You have uh, lived up to the expectations of the church. Um, how, does the, how does the story proceed? How, what, is the, what is the impetus to the great coming out? Right. How do we start resolving some of this pain that's built up for decades at this point? So a friend of mine that I met while living in Colorado, because that's where I went to grad school, uh, moving back to Utah, he created this group or was a part of this group of, of men called One Heart, One Light, and they created a men's retreat for, for about two and a half days, three days, and he invited me to go to it. I was at this point, I was working from home, um, trying to find a job that would meet our needs, another you know, responsibility of the husband and father. And I had this opportunity to go to this retreat where a lot of the men there were, are active in the church. A lot of them are inactive and a small handful are, um, are gay, but active or inactive, whatever the case may be. And during this retreat, we did an exercise where we um, had to pick a man in the group who was this way or that way or our assumptions of other men. And one of the questions was, who in this group is the least mechanical? And everybody came to me. And I was like, what are you people saying about me? You don't know me. But it's those assumptions that we make of other people. And I remember a guy in the group was asked why he chose me. And he said, look at this man, look how attractive he is. He's attractive, he dresses well. And that kind of like <laughs> made my insides kind of melt a little bit because not that I never got that from Leslie, but hearing that from a, a man was just kind of blew me away. And I was like, what is going on right now? And we had an opportunity that evening to reflect on the day. And we were sitting kind of in the circle journaling and, and kind of quiet moment of the evening. And that was about the moment my brain just made this click and began to unbox what I had held on to for since I was 12, 13 years old. And I began to file through and unpack slowly these contents. And it just kind of, everything just started like, peeling away slowly. And in that moment, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> like, what is happening right now? And, and it was one of those situations mentally and emotionally that I couldn't put back in. And the whole purpose of this retreat was to take away our assumptions of ourselves and 
um, how we felt about ourselves in past trauma or in getting rid of these things. But it was it was heavily um, encapsulated with like teachings of the church. But they did it in a way that was comforting and and helped me process and the other men process different things in our lives. But in that moment where this box started opening up and spilling out everything, I knew in that moment that I couldn't put that back in. And I couldn't I couldn't put it away anymore. And that was April of uh, 2021 when I went on that retreat. Um, but it wasn't until the beginning of August, four months later, when I came out to my wife. I'd love to talk about that scenario because I, I love the imagery of allowing um, allow, allowing ourselves to shine through and I mean I, ju- I just see I just remember have these visions of like the old cartoons when we were kids and um, you open this uncover this little treasure and like the gold was shining through and there right. was all this light and, and brightness and joy and and I kind of feel like that was the experience that you had at this retreat absolutely but then also how do you let how do you capture light and put it back in a box? Oh, there was no way. There was no way. And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to hold on to that light without dimming it again or putting that away. And yet still not coming out to my wife until four months later. And I will tell you within that four month period, our arguments or our frustrations with each other or um, the way we would talk to each other, it just exploded um, because we, we struggled communicating with each other. We struggled with being open about conversations, about different things with one another. And during those four months, I, I knew, I knew that once I come out to her, that what I had known for 14 years was just going to crumble. Just the foundation was just going to give out. and It was just going to crash. My world, our world was going to crash down. Did you think, um, this is typical uh, of many mixed orientation marriages, but did you, did you think that withholding that information from her was protecting her, that it was giving her cover um, and that you were taking and holding that pain inside as a duty, mm-hmm. as a responsibility, as the husband? I did. I did because how I felt from my experience as a convert and growing, you know, growing into that for those years and getting married, that whenever the man was struggling, the man would, the husband would, keep it inside they would withhold it because they didn't want that to affect the family as a whole and I didn't want to add to her frustrations or her challenges that she was going through because something that she was dealing with was well both of us was infertility for about six years we went through six years of different avenues that we would take to try to have children and I felt that if I did this to her, it was going to add on to her frustrations and her pain that I didn't want to be a cause of her breaking point. However, it was how my secret was it affecting me that was still adding to her frustration without her knowing the answer, without her knowing what it was that was that was causing me pain and in turn causing her the similar pain. Let's talk about the coming out experience. Oh, man. I remember I was at work. So I, at, the, at the residential treatment center, I was a mentor for about five months. And there's just so much pressure from that retreat. Not, the, not pressure from the retreat, but what I had went through there that was still playing a pivotal role in my story. Um, I was at work one night. It was about 10.30 at night, and I typed up like a novel of what I wanted to say. 
and I was pretty self-aware of the right words, not to hide anything, but the right words that would convey how I was feeling. And I did different drafts and deleted and typed and retyped sections. And when I felt really good about it, it took about a half an hour or so. I texted her and I said, I would like to sit down with you and talk when I get home from work. And she said, okay. And we got, I got home, settled down, sat down on our, on our couch in our living room. And I said, I have something that I want to share with you, but I would like to read it to you if you're okay with that. And I just went right into it. And I was shaky. I was nervous. I was sweaty. I was panicking. All the feelings kind of just tumbled over onto me all at once. And I explained to her, what I was going through. And I did share with her a little bit of that experience at the retreat that I went to. And she was quiet the whole time. She didn't say much. And I said to her that I'm gay. I told her right to her face. And I can see like this cloud of this cloud of sadness come across her face. And I can tell how hurt she was that for nearly 15 years that I kept this from her. And I'm a feeler, so I can really feel that heaviness that was weighing uh, in our living room. And after I had explained to her what was going on and, and what I was keeping from her. She sat there for a few moments and she looked at me in the eyes and she said, I knew something was going on, but I didn't realize it was this. And she got up and walked away. And I was kind of, I was left kind of dumbfounded. I didn't know what to expect from that. I didn't know if she wanted to continue a conversation. So finally she left, uh, Whenever we got in huge arguments, she would go for drives and just drive and drive and drive. And so I went to bed, got up the next day and went to work. And I got a call from her sister saying that she shouldn't have to feel uncomfortable in her own home and that I should find somewhere to go. And so I left work, packed a bag and sat in a parking lot next to our house for about an hour, not knowing what to do or to go or what or who to visit or who to see and it was kind of quiet for a few days I ended up staying at a friend's house for a few days while Leslie navigated this news and those few days were hell because here I am at a friend's house not knowing what what Leslie's dealing with because she didn't want to talk to me. And it just was another layer of this anxiety that I was experiencing. And also there has to be some anxiety surrounded, surrounding the absence of your daughter as well, uh, which had become your support system. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see Aria for about five days and I don't know what Leslie had told her, where I was at, what I was doing. Um, and that was worrisome for me, too. I remember at my friend's house, we were sitting on her porch, and she had me do this exercise where I sat with myself for about 15 minutes and just looking at my past life really looking back and doing this huge kind of check-in of my past and where I was at and where my past self had taken me and to thank my old self for the journey that he brought me on. And it was about 15 minutes or so that I did this and I would speak out loud because I felt comfortable with my friend hearing this. And she took my hands and she looked at me and she said, 
Now when you're ready, thank him and let him go. And I can tell you right now, even almost two years later, that was the most difficult thing to do was to let my old self go because I was comfortable there. I was comfortable in my church activity. I was comfortable in my role as a husband in the lie that I kept, like I was comfortable in that for so long. And having to let that go was like cutting off an appendage. Like I didn't want to, but I knew it was necessary. And it was the next day that I went home because Leslie wanted to talk. And she made a list of questions that she had to ask me. And I said, I am an open book. So ask what you want to ask. And her biggest one was in the years that we were married, if I ever stepped out on her, cheated on her. And I said, absolutely not. No, despite my sexuality, I dedicated everything to you and to our marriage. I did not, I did not ever do anything like that to you. I said, I struggled with this and that. And that was, that was it. And that was really the biggest thing that she had questions about. At the time when we were talking, our daughter had went with her cousins to a local park. And after Leslie and I had talked, we brought her home. And I um, sat her on my lap. And I told her that mom and I are going through some difficult times. And I said that um, it was really hard to look at her in the eyes. But I looked at her and said, We're, Mom and I are going to get a divorce. And of course, she was six and didn't know what that meant, really. And so I explained to her what a divorce was. I said, Mom and I really love each other still, but we have to do things differently now. And having to tell her that was the hardest thing for any parent, and especially for me, because I experienced separation growing up as a kid. And so um, we went our separate ways after that conversation. And at that time, I went home to Huntington to be with my family and to tell my family what was going on and why. So not only did I come out to Leslie, I came out to a whole slew of family members too within three days. And um, Ari didn't know why we were getting a divorce. I didn't tell her. But I did eventually did tell her about a year later, almost a year later, um, when when she found a, a book that I was borrowing from a friend. On Father's Day. On Father's of, Day. Of all days. Yeah. We were at a park and I was taking her home and she got into the car and I thought I thought I had it in my apartment. And she goes, Dad, what what is this book? And I was like, What book? And she said, Um, it says this book is gay. I'm like, great. <laughs> Here goes nothing. Here goes nothing. And I explained to her as as plainly as I possibly could what that meant. And I explained to her what that meant to me. And and I did eventually tell her that is why mom and I are getting a divorce. And again, it was very simple. I don't remember the conversation really. And I had told Leslie, like I texted her quickly <laughs> before I took Aria home. And in the drive home, Aria was super quiet in the back of the car. And I asked her, I was like, what are you thinking? What's, what are your thoughts? What are you feeling? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in my mind, I was like, please forget everything I just told you, okay? <laughs> Just don't remember it. But um, ever since then, Ari has been absolutely amazing. I lucked out with her. 
every time she sees a rainbow, she says, Dad, look, there's a rainbow. Or books that have rainbows on them. I've read her a couple of books, children books, about being gay and what that means. And it fascinates me just how supportive she is as a seven-year-old. And Leslie and I, we've, we've been blessed to have her in our lives. She's smart. She's intelligent. She's loving. And I just love how much she cares about, about me and what, what that looks like for our relationship as she gets older. And I think uh, we fail to realize or give children credit. They're resilient little monsters. They, oh, absolutely. They want to know two things, that they're safe and that they're loved. Mm -hmm. And give them those two things, even in the midst of these really hard life changes. Um, kids understand that. Kids understand love. They speak a language that is different and, and unique. And... Um, in my experience, my children were young as well when I came out. And so this life, uh, seeing their dad uh, married um, and even navigating this world as, as a single gay man, uh, the kids were resilient and they were loving and they were kind and they were understanding. And it's also um, what they've grown to know and embrace as part of their uh, family. Right. And so they've they've had that beautiful experience to see um, healthy relationships and, and they've been able to grow in this nuance, which has been super beneficial for our family and like, likely for your family as well. Right. Aria is a strong little kid and we've been able to manage the two households in ex expressing our love for her and teaching her. And it's, a whole different kind of teaching now. Um, obviously, her, her mom is still active in the church, and so there's that teaching, that growing up in the church. And for me, it's respecting that and not doing like the secular teaching, but a whole different level of teaching and explaining to her that there are kids that she knows that have two moms or two dads, and that's life. That's how it works. You, you can love who you want to love. And she gets that concept. And it, it blows my mind just knowing that she, in, her, in her brain, she can analyze that yeah. and understand that. And I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how to express what that means to me to have, to have her in my life and getting that concept. And I think, I mean, as we progress forward in your story, there has to be this relief that um, you're able to, sh to show up um, authentically and honest, honestly in Arya's life. You're, you're able to be the dad that she needed. Um, you're able to uh, be there 100%, mm -hmm. um, which is so much different than where you were at closeted, running, hiding, building these fortresses, mm -hmm. building these facades in front of our, um, our faces right. to give the world a perception of who and what we are. That doesn't exist anymore. No. No, once I, once I opened up to Aria and came out to her, like I knew it was going to be progressive, a progressive conversation. It's going to change. It's going to adapt. And the more I'm open with Ari about it, the more she gets it and the more I understand how she picks up on things and how she understands concepts. Again, she's seven years old, but it's interesting to see that she goes, oh, okay, like the light bulb turned on and she can see it. Um, and it's been an interesting past year, my relationship with Leslie. Like, of course, this is the hardest thing that we've gone through both of us, she still has her life that she needs to navigate. And the longer that our divorce has been finalized and this life has opened up, I can sense that she's becoming supportive in her own way, and there's no timeline to it. She has in, invited me to sit by them when Aria has 
activities and stuff. And so it's been really good for our relationship. And my hope for our future is that on her timeline, that'll be more open and more supportive. I, I still love her. She was my wife for nearly 15 years. She's the mother of our daughter. I still have this respect for her because she went through so much during our marriage. I like to label as compassion fatigue. Like it just, she, it was hard for her. It was difficult for her. Sure. And, and I never want to take away her from her experience or to place blame on her and anything. And I'm not placing blame on myself. It, it was all circumstantial. It was different situations. Um, but I, I want to give her the the respect that she deserves. I think, uh, I mean, you walked into that beautiful explanation of where your life is at now uh, with some descriptors. You said that things are now positive, things are now progressive, things are now moving. And I, I like those um, because that moves us to one of the best parts of Colby's story, I think. And that is where you're at today. Um, so much different in terms of where you're at. Let's talk about what life looks like today. I'm getting super emotional about it. I mentioned this before on a, on a previous podcast that I thought I had to be completely healed to be able to um, love again and to have uh, someone in my life who sees me for me and values me. Not that Leslie never did, but I now I have a man in my life who I cherish and who loves me for who I am and gives me an added level of support and love that I thought I would never get. Um, back last year in September, Ari was over at our apartment and I sat her down and I explained to her that I'm dating somebody and she's like, who? And I was like, Brett. And Brett was sitting across from us and her eyes get wide, kind of like computing. I can see the wheels in her head turning. And I said to her, you remember talking that you have some friends who have two moms? And she goes, yeah. She goes, well, you know, there are often times two when two men get together and they love each other and they express that love for one another. And I said, I have Brett now in my life. And having watching their relationship flourish and grow has been so relieving for me. And, you know, when I came out to her and on Father's Day, I was panicking. I was like, how are, how are, how are we going to do this? How am I going to do this? And I waited several months until I told her about Brett and I, but that moment was right. Um, Brett and I, we got engaged at the beginning of December last year. Aria doesn't know yet. I, it may be like the same situation as the book. She may come across something. I don't know. Um, but when that moment's right, it will happen. Whether if it's me doing it or if the universe is going to throw that into the, into the mix. But I no longer have to worry about it because I'm living my life the way I've wanted to live it since I was 13 years old. That is a long time. It was a long time. But here I am in a position in my life where I'm extremely happy and the healing process is finally wrapping up, I feel like, right now. I think uh, this is the perfect part of the podcast to um, reflect back to that 13-year-old Colby. What advice do you have? I know you let him go. Yeah. What advice do you have for other 13-year-old Kobe's out there? I know it sounds cliche, but I would say never give up on yourself, on your true self, that one day you're going to find who you are. You're going to find yourself through so many challenges and disruptions and frustrations and 
They may come down to like mental health types of situations. But I want to say that there is hope. There is. There is hope. And no amount of self-hatred or anger at yourself is is going to fix it. It's it's that pushing forward that that you have to do. I did it. And I know a lot of other people's stories are different, of course, that may end up differently, but there's still hope in in your story. What is your advice to those who find themselves today in a mixed orientation marriage who feel there is no way out, that the pain of coming clean, of having that conversation with their spouse is just too much and not worth it? You have to make a decision today. I had to make a decision. Knowing that it was the hardest, most difficult decision, I had to make it because I was tired. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was tired of the anxiety, the constant anxiety attacks that I had I was I, because I knew the answer. So the advice I would give is make a decision today. And make it the right one. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to talk about on this episode? Something that you wanted the audience to, to know um, going in to, to this opportunity of, of sharing your experience? Was there a hope that you wanted to get across, a message you wanted the audience to embrace? I think really is bottom line is living your life authentically. And work through those facades, work through breaking those down, being unapologetic. There's so much room in this world, and I was confined. I caused myself that confinement, and now I'm in a position, I'm, I don't know, I don't care how many times I'm going to share my story. I want to continue sharing my story with people, because people need to hear it. I wouldn't label it like a success story because there's still a lot of growth that I have to do, but I successfully came out of a challenge. I successfully came out of the closet. It was hard. It was, there were barriers, there were walls that I had to break down, but I've, I did it. And I know that through my story, I want to inspire people and I, I like to use a line that my story can be another person's survival guide. I want people to be able to survive these challenges and not take another route. There's hope after challenges. There's, there, are, there's, there are hopeful things, things to be excited for. People just, I hope people are able to push through that. I love that. I love, le I love leaving these episodes on a positive note where uh, we give a little uh, affirmation of, of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if anything, I, I want people to know that they're not alone, um, that they're not broken, and that their best days are ahead. Right. And, and it's through the sharing of stories that we're able to achieve that. I know there are people out there who resonate so well with your story because it's their story as well. And whether they're in or outside of that closet... Um, on either side of that door, mm -hmm. they they resonate and they understand and, and see. I, I also think that there are likely um, straight spouses in mixed orientation marriages that are listening to stories like this, um, hoping that their closeted husband or closeted wife is able to make a move Absolutely. and, and uh, realizes the importance of, of loving and being loved as much or as completely as possible. Right. Colby, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for giving an audience, uh, th this audience, a peek into your life and for candidly sharing uh, some difficult parts of this journey, but also for being an example of, just as you said, what that success and what overcoming um, a very difficult part of this journey can do for us. Right. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to share my story. And as I said, I, I want to be able to do that more often because people need to hear it. So I really appreciate this opportunity. 
Thank you again. Uh, for those of you um, who have questions for you, Colby, um, we're all on social media, so yeah. <laughs> happy to answer some of those questions as well. And, and, and maybe there are other people out there who have personal questions. So um, how do we get a hold of you? How, find, how do we find you on social media at least? I mean, uh, I'm Facebook. Col my full name is Colby James Majors. And then on Instagram, it's Majors Colby is my handle. Um, I'm, I'm an open book, and I want to be able to be that source, that resource for people. I mean, I'm not an expert. I have enough background to know how to speak with people and how to talk with people, but I really want people to reach out because I want to be there for them. Uh, you have um, more than 10 years in this space, so that technically makes you a doctor. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, you have a PhD. <laughs> in navigating sexuality so congratulations fair enough hey thanks yeah I've, I've hereby given you an honorary degree oh that's awesome <laughs> colby again thank you thank you and to you our latter gay stories audience we want to thank you for giving us uh, a little bit more than an hour of your time today to better understand this experience uh, again if you are watching on a video version of this podcast episode and you do have a question for colby or a comment about this episode um, or even uh, a relation to it if you are a product of a mixed orientation marriage if you are um if the the topic of a mixed orientation marriage is part of your story as well and you want to share a comment about that please uh, use the comment section uh, to do that here on the facebook or vi uh, youtube video uh, versions of, of this episode and if you are listening on an audio version of the podcast episode as well we thank you for that and we invite you to subscribe to this channel it's stories like mine, it's stories like Colby's, and it's stories like yours that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story.